First of all, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be again in Estonia. Oh, it's been almost a year. Um, and uh, even though I'm sorry to admit, I still don't speak Estonian at all. Uh, but that does not in no way mean that I didn't enjoy the previous three presentations. Uh, so thank you for that as well. Um, I was thinking about how to reframe this project that we've been quite intensely working on for over a year. Um, and I was uh, going through some of the older versions, older pictures that we uh, were submitting in some of the previous iterations of the design. And I, I came across this um, image, which was one of the very few, very first images that we did um, about the installation in, in Venice. And um, it, struck, it struck me that in, in many ways, um, the project in the end ended up completely different, but the kind of essence of it has been already in this image. So what we actually see is an installation in church. That's about it. And uh, on either side of the church, there are two projects of which one is kind of iconic uh, and really well known, Vladimir Stadlin, um, um, spiraling tower, uh, this kind of 250 meters utopian project which was supposed to be the headquarters of Communist Party, um, designed in the 20s. And on the other side, the kind of Estonian counter part to this project, the uh, Lapin's shed uh, that um, Roland discovered uh, uh, quite randomly while reading uh, a book on Lapin. And um, this was um, Lapin's kind of satirical version of the Tatlin's Tower, uh, which uh, features quite prominently in, throughout the project, which kind of inspired all of us as well, um, but w which uh, introduces a certain kind of uh, uh, humor into the discussion of what is a monument, um, which we were intrigued by from the beginning. But then, yeah, there are these two projects that are, you'll see some of them in the exhibition, um, I think we spoke about them also previously in some of the previous talks. But what's in the middle and what's quite uh, prominent on this view as well is uh, the, this kind of row of or boulevard of books. Uh, and and uh, that really is for us actually from the very start has been um, the project. What's, uh, is you got this kind of spectrum between an explicit monument or what claims to be a monument, this uh, Tatlin's Tower. Uh, which is something that's uh, extremely expressive, heroic, 300, almost 300 meters tall. And on the other hand, something every day, a domestic uh, shed for a donkey. Uh, and uh, we are quite interested in, yeah, the, both of these extremes are interesting, but what is it that's in between? How do you define this kind of journey from something small and insignificant to something that is the kind of national scale and historic? And uh, that for us, was uh, the excuse to form this collection of, uh, of, uh, of monuments on either side of this spectrum. And I, uh, I thought I, I would try to use the pages of the book to kind of structure this presentation. Um, I will not always explain what you see, but uh, feel free if you are interested in what do you see and you cannot uh, recognize it, uh, interrupt me at any point, I'll be very happy to explain. Um, this, um, what we mean when we speak about monuments. Quite simply, monument is, uh, or a memorial is a statue on a plinth in a public space. Um, and there is nothing extremely exciting about it. Uh, Robert Musil has, uh, has noticed that uh, monuments are invisible in their uh, kind of everydayness. Uh, and, but what we were in, interested in was what is below these monuments? Because in some ways, the monument is just an ornament of that which it stands on, which is the plinth. And that is an articulation of as an importance of a public space. In this case, uh, it's, it's this, um, this is Tallinn, of course. But the, the, the statue of Peter the Great was taken down only 10 years after it was erected. But the pavement underneath has stayed there, I think, up to a uh, uh, really long time. <laughs> um, so we, were, we started to question what is then this, what is underneath the monuments? It's first, of course, first it's the plinth then. Um, and we were starting to put next to each other historic images and uh, uh, some of our own interests, some, uh, some, uh, some 
images of places that, that we know personally. Uh, on the left here, for instance, you see the... Uh, can I actually place this? This is kind of slightly... <laughs> So on the left uh, here, you see uh, a photograph of, um, I think, the first uh, pride, uh, which I kind of understand has vague uh, relation to the previous talk. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and there you can see that uh, uh, the, the, the people that took part in the march are taking the, the plinth of Nelson's column as a kind of a stage. Um, and where they kind of manifest the presence uh, as, as them as a sexual minority in the city. They, they kind of explicitly go up onto the plinth and, uh, and say, yes, we, we are here as well uh, in the city. And on the other side, in a kind of similar, slightly darker iteration of the same situation is, um, is a monument in Prague which is guarded on the, on the date of a sensitive historic anniversary, which has nothing to do with the monument in question, but the, the, the base of it could potentially become a stage for any kind of protest. Um, so the base in itself has a certain kind of agency, and uh, it's a kind of ready-made stage for anyone to claim it. Um, but then the pavement as well is, uh, is this kind of articulation of public space that we are interested in. And it's in the kind of exceptional situations such as a march, a protest, um, or, um, uh, or some kind of resurgence where the kind of fine differences between the explicit monument and the implicit uh, political uh, power within the pavement are manifest. This is a quite well-known picture as well from Paris, the Vendome uh, monument, which was taken down by Gustave uh, Colbert, the painter. And there you see this, this kind of distinction between the, 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 the obelisk, the plinth, the pavement, but also barricade, which is also constructed from the pavement. It's, it's not that clear, and this kind of blurred line is exactly what we were trying to explore. Sometimes something as simple as a staircase, um, as this, this example of the one in the Hiva Park, is, um, can also become a stage for a protest, um, which is the, the example of the um, Estonian independence protest, which were, uh, they took place here because the squares were forbidden to be used. Um, and um, so this kind of potential in the uh, forms of public space to, to hold a rally uh, is something we're really interested in as well. But then it can even be even more subtle. This is uh, the uh, example actually very close to here. Um, sometimes uh, a such simple gesture as making a road fully accessible, uh, as is the project of uh, Thomas Paver, uh, and the activists from the local street as well. Um, it's a political gesture in itself because um, to make a street accessible for everyone is um, an ultimately democratic gesture. So f the kind of idea that from the monument on the plinth to the pavement or even just asphalt, there is a kind of a spectrum that is what this book is all about, I would say. And um, so how did we approach this? We um, have a, uh, we were quite inspira inspired by this, by the, the German historian, uh, Abbe Warburg, um, who in the 20s was exploring um, um, how antiquity can be useful for modern art. And even though that's interesting in, interested in itself, we are more interested in how this can be used as a method. And this is a picture of us trying to assemble all these different images in in London, and some of, as I said, some of them are archive photos that were scanned, some of them are just our personal shots. And Estonia is a perfect place, we always thought, or like, this is a really interesting base to explore this idea of what a, a monument can be, because the Estonian experience with monuments has always been questionable. I will not go through this again, because I understand Laura has spoken briefly about this in the beginning. Um, so, um, again, I will not always uh, explain exactly uh, everything about these shots, but there is a certain kind of a relation between the monument in its ruined state that can take in, on itself both meanings of the kind of everyday, uh, as in the, this painting by Hubert Robert, or um, in the kind of exceptional situation of a war, of a revolution. And uh, sometimes these monuments are 
explicit monuments, meant as monuments, designed as monuments, and sometimes it's just a, an occurrence or a coincidence. But that does not n at all mean that it's not any less significant for the community or the city. Um, it's not only architecture, of course, that can have a shared meaning. A landscape in its uh, either ruined or retained state can and often is um, a carrier of meanings which uh, last for longer than the constructed monuments. And then sometimes columns go from vertical to horizontal, um, and then um, this kind of ruined state of them um, opens them to new perspectives and new audiences. Um, monuments of powers that uh, are not understood as, um, as in line with the uh, current political situations are taken down and then, the, then we can see pictures of the, the crowd kind of in a half scared and half triumphant way standing around. This is an, an example from Prague. Uh, it's a Habsburg column taken down, but at the same time an everyday public space which is um, has a kind of interesting ruin form as well, has a, can have a meaning uh, which is not, maybe not less important. And the idea of care and how we care for monuments and how we, um, how the idea that uh, this is on the left you see a picture by uh, John Ruskin uh, from Venice uh, where he was kind of uh, giving us a warning which now becomes all the more topical that uh, um, and ultimately too much care uh, can hurt uh, a historic monument. And on the other side, and this, this in the case of Venice, uh, we can see that very clearly. And on, on the other side, this is an example from, from Czech, where I'm from, where um, uh, derelict stadium was uh, re is being um, re reused by the local community um, for, for kind of amateur football tournaments, which also means that it cannot be fully refurbished because the community would then lose this kind of half informal space. And then um, I will not go into the details of the installation, but of course these topics uh, such as the ruination and care um, are recurrent in uh, what we did in Venice as well. Some of it you will see in the exhibition, some of it uh, will remain in Venice, such as the corridor of the Santa Maria Auxiliatrice Church, which because of the recurrent flooding, which we were promised by the way by the a real estate agent never happens, uh, uh, takes down the internal plaster and it creates this kind of interesting decoration. And then um, we're also always quite interested in, the, in this idea that there's something really comical about the monuments as if they were out of place. Um, I think best illustrated by here on the right the uh, few stills from the music video of the JM Key. K.E. Uh, uh, band called Dick Monument, uh, which kind of exemplifies what, she, what, what is already inherent in each monument in the erection of objects in public space. Uh, and, uh, but it's very easy for monuments to be ridiculous uh, or funny. This is a placeholder for a monument for Martin Luther, uh, which was taken away. Um, so it's a kind of a monument to a monument or a, a placeholder placeholder for the future, um, which again you shows something which is actually common to all monuments, but not always is shown so explicitly. Um, and this kind of idea that if you hide something, it disappears, uh, is of course funny in itself. This is a, a picture of the refurbishment of Lenin mausoleum in Moscow, where they tried to hide this, under this, uh, this inflatable dome to prevent uh, unwanted sites, but of course that only attracts more attention. Um, um, but then again, to re remove something can be a really serious, significant act in itself. This is a proposal for the monument to the victims of Holocaust by uh, Horst uh, Hoheisel, uh, who proposed to demolish the Brandenburg Tor in Berlin as a kind of a sign of repentance. Um, and in some ways, uh, this, um, this experience that I understand is very present in Estonia that the sea, even though almost omnipresent, uh, was never accessible, was always this kind of emptiness uh, that you can never reach, um, has a certain kind of set relation to, uh, to taking, taking away something that 
should be present. Um, when you take something away, something always remains. And this is a, a picture from Budapest, where in the 58 protest, uh, a sculpture or statue of uh, Stalin was taken down, and of which only the shoes remained. And uh, for a really long time, this was called uh, Stalin's shoes. Um, and that's again a bit funny. What's not that funny is that uh, in Hungary, monuments are now again being removed by the uh, authoritarian Orban uh, government. Um, and um, this is a picture that was uh, in the news just a couple of weeks ago, um, a base of a monument to Imre Nagy, who was one of the leaders of the, of, uh, of the kind of revolution uh, movement. Um, and the, the, to take away can also be an artistic or an architectural gesture. As is, this is a catafalque to Imre Nagy, in, uh, actually, in, in Budapest, where um, this, uh, the, the museum, this kind of really important public building on the square, was, was covered. Um, um, and again, to cover something is a, is a kind of a way to restructure a space, is something that we uh, also try to use in Venice, and hopefully we'll see a bit of that in the other room. Um, and um, to illustrate how we work, this is a, this is a painting uh, that I think Roland quite randomly saw on, uh, in an exhibition. Uh, sorry, I have to look up the name of the author. Um, it's Andres Stoltz painting from 1983, which really shows um, just a wall in the city and how the wall can also take on itself uh, through its emptiness, some kind of future meaning, such as this example from Prague, where um, a wall was painted over uh, by police because of some unwanted signs in 1980s. Um, and then this kind of white blank canvas provoked um, artists, but also just people to come there again to the wall and appropriate it even further. And uh, eventually this became um, what now is a, one of the touristic highlights, the John Lennon wall, John, the monument to John Lennon. But this was all provoked by the blankness of the wall. And then how, how you can go from an explicit monument or from something that was meant to be a monument to something that just uh, happened to have an important meaning was something that we are really interested to explore via this tool of uh, scaffolding because scaffolding makes accessible what, what usually would not be accessible. And again, this is something that we try to uh, use in the case of the Santa Maria Auxiliatrice church uh, where the altar is a kind of a representative of a monument in itself, and around it we are building our own structures. Um, and this we were to a great extent inspired by uh, a project also here in Tallinn, the um, EKA uh, design for the uh, St. Mary's Cathedral, um, where the, the altar could be accessed uh, by visitors on uh, appointed dates and kind of give new perspectives to the altar. So the scaffolding makes approachable what usually would not be approachable, but it also just elevates. So maybe the scaffolding in itself can be a monument. Maybe the, this kind of sculpture underneath is not required anymore. We've seen quite a lot of it, and we see it still on the paintings of the, the medieval scaffolds, where, where um, um, this kind of, this cruel, cruel punishment would be uh, taking place for the public to see. But it can, again, be much more mundane. Uh, a scaffolding can just be a way to make accessible uh, something that is, has previously not been accessible, or simply just to elevate a person in the crowd. Um, and as I said previously, to make a space accessible is one of the most ultimate, one of the ultimate political gestures architect can make. So something uh, as simple as a curbstone not to say it is a monument, can be positioned on this, on this spectrum as well. And uh, monuments have also insides, which also have a kind of resemblance to scaffolding or a certain kind of frame. Um, and again, this idea that you can be inside of a monument is something that we, can, we were trying to explore as well. On the left, you see a, an interior, interior view of the, uh, I think, uh, St. Giovanni Colossus in Italy, which is this kind of uh, 10 to 1 statue of a saint. 
um, which needs to have a supporting structure in, inside. And on the right, of course, uh, the uh, view of the installation. And then to kind of come to conclusion, um, if the monument is standing on the base and the base is standing on the pavement, how can we try to learn what those implicit meanings in, in the pavement are? Because monuments are in some ways less problematic than pavement and architecture of public space because they are openly standing there and uh, kind of having a having standing for something, for a person or an event, while the unspoken uh, rules and obstacles within the public space can be questioned in a much more difficult way. On the right, on the left, you see a demolition of Stalin's monument in Prague in the 60s. On the right, you see the first sign of Berlin Wall before the Berlin Wall was constructed, which was just this kind of steel bar interrupting a street in Berlin. So pavement for us, in many ways, was this kind of most extreme uh, example of what a monument can be. And again, that's something we explored uh, to great extent in Venice as well. And then last would be the, I, would be the concept of a house as a place where bodies are sheltered, uh, would potentially dead bodies. So we are speaking about the most classical monument you can think of. Um, but also life living bodies. And if the dead body can provoke, even after centuries, um, passions and fears, then uh, the living bodies, in many ways, have the same potential. Um, we were quite struck by uh, the, the quite common occurrence of people protesting in public spaces in 2009. Um, where tents would be constructed. Uh, for instance, this is the case of Parliament Square on the right side. And, the, and the, the fact that the police somehow recognizes the fact that this is not just a tent can be seen in the fact that this is not how you move a tent. You don't, this is not how you move a tent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there is something in the tent which is not just the tent. Um, so this has been done in a kind of a slightly reordered, a bit more personal way this, to explore this, what is in between this explicit monument, the actual monument and this shed, or um, something domestic, something imagined. Um, and that in between is really the book and all the examples in it, of which I only showed a um, few. Um, and the, we were wondering what's what, what did we finish the installation? Uh, there is a kind of installation about the installation in the other room. Um, but we're hoping that the, the book is a way to bring some of what we've learned in Estonia, but also what Estonia can offer to, to the discussions on how political power is embedded in architecture. Um, and we've been uh, sent the kind of postcards or screenshots, these, the pictures of the book appearing in different parts of the world. And it's been very moving to receive those. The first from London, the second from, I think, Bern, the third from Copenhagen, and the one from Tokyo. And we were just really happy to see Wick Monument traveling the world in the kind of our place as a, as a tourist. Uh, so this is a kind of optimistic end to my talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was going to ask a question about the potential of weak monument, but I'm not going to do this because there's an exhibition that will need to be opened as well. But I am going to ask if there's anyone who would like to ask something from Tadeas, from the audience. No. Oh, Roland, classic audience member. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tadeus. Um, Hi, Roland. <laughs> um, I picked up one word uh, that you started the presentation with. You said uh, that the book is a project, a project by its own means. And uh, a project, um, I think there are different versions, but it comes from the word, word, word projection 
and it means planned traject trajectory. So it comes from war periods when they would shoot bullets and they needed to calculate exactly where does the bullet land. So this is where the project comes and you kind of try to plan everything that's coming ahead. And um, you, so you propose that um, you know, this, this project, the book is also a project. Um, I was wondering if the book is a project and the book is a research, so can a research become a monument? Well, hopefully not. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tricky question, Roland. <laughs> um, I think research is something that opens topics and kind of analyzes, takes things apart, while monument is something that synthesizes and makes fixed uh, and possible to question um, so I, I, I would say that there is a certain kind of inherent opposition, really, between a research and a monument, not to say a project and a research, which I think is what the research, research should always be. But in a kind of my personal view, I think there is a lot to learn from monuments, um, but not a lot to copy and take over. Thank you. Thanks to the